It is good to be with you again tonight. If you have any updates to our prayer concerns, I hope you will give me a call or send an email. Uh, please also remember that we are continuing to meet every Lord's Day at 9 o'clock in the morning. And then we are also, if that fills up, if we have 25 people at that first service signed up, uh, we'll also be replaying the 9 o'clock service at 10.30 a.m. at the church building using the projector at the front of the auditorium. And so if you need any help signing up, if you have any questions at all uh, about our schedule, please contact either me or Kenna. But if you're listening by phone and if you need any help with this or if you have anything that we need to be praying about, I hope you will give me a call at 608-224-0274. And even though we do not have a, a live in-person service at 1030, even though we'll be replaying that on the projector, uh, our phone and our online options will be the same. So that'll go on as scheduled. So no changes there. Uh, tonight, we are getting back to our study of the book of Luke. And by way of review, and in case you might be joining us for the first time, we know Luke is a Gentile. He is a medical doctor. He writes both Luke and Acts to a man by the name of Theophilus. He makes a point of writing in chronological order. So almost all of Luke is in just perfect chronological order. He does a uh, well-researched account, we might say. That was uh, his goal in doing this. Tonight we have a rare exception to that as the Lord's Supper, the institution of the Lord's Supper, is a little bit out of order in Luke, which is interesting. And I think that he does that for a reason. We'll get back to that next week. So we're going to leave out a few verses tonight and come back to those uh, in a little bit of a better chronological order next week, if the Lord wills. Uh, we also know Luke includes a number of people who are often overlooked in the ancient world and sometimes oppressed. And we're talking there about women and widows, Gentiles, at least in terms of the Jewish people. They were often overlooked and ignored and abused. Uh, Samaritans, for sure, that was a, a racial ethnic group that was uh, very often, they were often abused by the Jewish people, as well as the sick and the poor. And Luke does a, a very good job of including a lot of these groups that the other gospel accounts really overlook as well. In our study tonight, we move into what happens on Wednesday before the Lord's crucifixion. And tonight we're going to pick up with the last few verses of Luke chapter 21. So we'll be starting tonight in Luke 21, 37. And we'll start in Luke 21, 37 in just a moment. Uh, by way of review, last week we looked at Jesus' predictions concerning the destruction of Jerusalem as well as the end of the age. And by way of reminder, if we remember anything from last week, I would try to emphasize Look at Matthew's account. And so if you start in Luke and try to figure this out, the difference between the destruction of Jerusalem and the Lord's second coming, uh, it can be, be a bit confusing because there is some symbolic or figurative language worked in there. So my suggestion in studying uh, Luke chapter 21 is to go back and start with Matthew. Look at Matthew chapter 24. And you may remember last week we had some of the text from Matthew 24 on the screen. And we're dealing with a number of questions. The disciples, I don't think, even realize that they're asking multiple questions. But when will the signs of these things be? When will this thing take place? They're referring to the destruction of Jerusalem there. But then when will the end of the age be? Well, they thought those were one and the same. Well, they aren't. And, of course, Jesus gave some signs for the destruction of Jerusalem. Wars and rumors of wars and all of these other things. When you see these signs take place, then it's time to run for the hills. Get out of there so that you're not caught up in the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. And of course, from history, we know that Christians did, in fact, flee. They listened to those warnings. They looked at the signs and they did, in fact, get out of there. Uh, unlike a vast majority of the Jewish people who ran into the city for safety, which is exactly what Jesus said not to do. Um, then, of course, there is that point right between verses uh, 35 and 36. That's where we put that dotted blue line. Everything before verse 35 refers to the destruction of Jerusalem back there in Matthew 24. Everything after verse 35 refers to the Lord's second coming. And so before verse 35, signs, 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 and signs. And then after verse 35 or 36 there, the cutoff, no signs. It'll be a surprise, like a thief in the night kind of thing. One will be taken, one will be left. It'll be uh, at a time nobody expects. And so there is a clear division in Matthew 24. So my suggestion, just by way of review, in figuring out the difference between these two events in the book of Luke is to start by going back to Matthew, because Matthew, writing with the mind of a, of a tax lawyer or an accountant, 
um, he gets that in a very precise way, makes it a little bit more, a uh, little bit easier to understand. All right, so that's kind of a, a where we left off last week. Uh, as to tonight's study, the Harmony of the Gospels will once again be very helpful tonight. In case you're interested, the Harmony of the Gospels that we're using can be purchased on Amazon for around 25 bucks. It's basically just the four gospel accounts arranged in columns parallel to each other so we can compare and contrast between the four accounts and so we have everything arranged in chronological order. Uh, the harmony is especially helpful in the last week of the Lord's life right before the crucifixion. We have a lot going on in the four accounts and it's very hard to get those in chronological order. Most of the book of John gets added in here, I think from like John 13 on. So at least half of the book of John gets inserted right here at the last week of the Lord's life. And so the harmony does a good job of fitting that in and telling us where all that needs to go. And what's really helpful is the chart on page 349. And so tonight, if you have the harmony with you, I would invite you to turn to page 349. I think that's uh, the next to the last opening in the book right before you get to the blank pages right there at the end and the authors list the events really of the whole three and a half years on the left hand side and then on the right hand side i think that's page 349 they have everything just from the last week so they zoom in right there on the last week and they put it all there with the section numbers and so it goes sunday monday tuesday and so on through that week and so if you're confused about where something gets plugged in, look at the section number back where we're reading it in the main text of the harmony. And tonight, for example, I think we're in section 209. So take that section 209, go to that page 349 and plug that in and look that up in the chart. And we find that what we're about to study most likely takes place on Wednesday, just uh, two days before the Lord's crucifixion. So that kind of helps us get these things in the proper order. As we head toward Luke 21:37, where we're starting tonight, I want to point out that during this last week, Jesus was in the habit of teaching in the temple during the daytime and then heading out to spend the night on the Mount of Olives. And so I'm putting a picture of the Mount of Olives on the screen. If you can see that, that's great. Uh, the picture is taken from the Mount of Olives. So the photographer here is standing maybe where Jesus was camping out that night. And he's looking down into the valley. And then on the other side of the valley, as it goes back up on the other side, you'll notice uh, what we would consider to be the Temple Mount. Of course, as we discussed last week, the temple was completely destroyed in 70 AD. It has not been rebuilt. And a lot of controversy about that. It's a, it's a hugely significant archaeological site, uh, very uh, strategic in terms of several of the world's major religions, Judaism, uh, Christianity, and Islam, all have, uh, we might say, holy sites, if you want to word it in that way, right at this location. So it's very tense in that area, to say the least. An Islamic shrine known as the Dome of the Rock was built in the, I think, 690s AD, and the Dome of the Rock is that gold-colored dome in the middle of that picture. That is where the temple used to be. If you can make it out, there is a, a huge, I would call it almost a retaining wall around that area. And that, that was literally the retaining wall that held up the temple. And that was just scraped clean by the Romans, not one stone left on top of another. Well, hundreds of years later, um, they built this, uh, this shrine uh, to Islam there right on that spot. So a, a significant location there, a lot of controversy on that spot, very difficult to do any kind of archaeological excavation or digs because uh, everybody's afraid what the other side might find and they don't want to allow that at all. So a lot of tension right there. Well, again, the Mount of Olives is in the foreground. Today, the Mount of Olives is basically a Jewish cemetery. And so if you look down at the bottom of this picture very carefully, you may notice all of those white boxes. Um, all of the white boxes down there at the bottom, those are graves. Those are coffins enclosed in some kind of brick structures. Um, I think of some of the cemeteries down near, um, down, down in Louisiana, down in the Gulf Coast uh, with the flooding that they have. You, you see a lot of that. They're not buried underground, but they're buried right there on the surface and have uh, rocks or whatever piled up and some kind of uh, memorials put there. So that's what those white boxes are at the bottom. There are uh, thousands upon thousands, primarily of Jewish people who are buried right there on the side of the Mount of Olives. Uh, this is another picture from roughly the same angle, different time of day. This is looking from the southeast toward the northwest. If you can get that in mind, we're looking toward the northwest. 
Uh, only in this picture we have more of the Mount of Olives in the foreground. And I hope that's obvious there. I hope you can see that. I think it's a little bit easier. It's a whole lot easier to see the cemetery. It takes up about half of the picture here. But notice, I mean, to me, from this angle, it just looks like acres upon acres of graves. And that, again, that is what is located there on the Mount of Olives today. So basically, as we're about to read in this next verse, I wanted to look at this before we got there, but as we're going to notice in this next verse, Jesus would teach in the temple during the day. And then he would cross over this small valley here, right about halfway through our picture on the screen. And then he would head up to the Mount of Olives, roughly where this photographer is standing. And he would then spend the night on the Mount of Olives. So this was his campsite. And of course, at the time, as I said, it was not a massive cemetery, but it was literally the Mount of Olives. It was a grove of olive trees. And so it was the Mount of olives. So that, that gives us some background as to what we're looking at. So let's start tonight with Luke 21 verse 37 and let's continue reading down through chapter 22 verse 2. So we have this paragraph that, that splits across the chapter division there. But Luke 21 37 down through chapter 22 verse 2. Now during the day he was teaching in the temple but at evening he would go out and spend the night on the mount that is called Olivet. And all the people would get up early in the morning to come to him in the temple to listen to him. Now the feast of unleavened bread, which is called the Passover, was approaching. The chief priest and the scribes were seeking how they might put him to death, for they were afraid of the people." So again, in the harmony, we find Luke is the only one who tells us about Jesus' custom on that last week, that he would teach in the temple during the day, but at night he would go out and spend the night on the Mount of Olives. Uh, one or two of the commentaries were pointing out, as far as we know, Jesus never spends the night in the city of Jerusalem. And with the significance of Jerusalem being the city of David and all that, that does perhaps seem to be at least a little bit significant, doesn't it? that Jesus, the son of David, the son of God, descendant of David, the king, and, and so on, would not even spend the night in his own city, which is interesting to me. And to me, it's almost as if the city was not worthy of him staying there. And so he would teach there during the day, but at night he would not spend the night in the city. He would go out and he would camp on the side of the Mount of Olives. We also find here that the people would get up early in the morning just to come to listen to Jesus. Uh, I think of the morning lectures at places like Polishing the Pulpit or Fried Hardeman University Bible Lectures. Those are two lectureships that I uh, normally attend each year. And they might schedule a really good speaker at the 7.30 a.m. time slot. But it's only one speaker. <laughs> they don't have the customary 10 choices to, to choose from at 7.30 because nobody gets up that early. Um, but they have usually one choice. They have one speaker at 7 or 7.30 in the morning. And, and those who do attend are, are pretty hardcore. Uh, either that or they are the ones camping <laughs> who get up at the crack of dawn. But we find in this passage that people were changing their plans, it seems, to come and hear the Lord teach and preach early in the morning. So we learn something from the crowds. Uh, they knew a good thing when they heard it. That these were not the religious leaders. These were the common people who heard the Lord gladly and were impressed by his teaching. This was their custom, and it was the Lord's custom to meet them there. Uh, Jesus was no slacker. He got up early in the morning, and he got it done. He took advantage of every opportunity that he had. And so this was Jesus' custom, to get up early in the morning to go teach, and there were many people who would listen to him there. As we move over into Luke 22, Mark's account tells us that the Passover was two days off. That's where it uh, dates this section to Wednesday. Luke simply tells us that the Feast of Unleavened Bread, also called Passover, was approaching, so no exact time given. Uh, at this point, Matthew has Jesus explaining to his disciples privately that after two days, the Son of Man will be delivered up for crucifixion. So we find that over in Matthew's account. Uh, then in Luke 22.2, Luke explains that the chief priest and the scribes are plotting and they are looking for some way to put Jesus to death, but they are afraid of the people. And so Jesus is very popular, and we notice that. We've just looked at that, that people were getting up early just to hear him teach and preach. And yet the Jewish leaders, uh, Matthew and Mark, both explain that they are afraid of a riot breaking out. These men are 
cowards. They don't have the courage to go do to Jesus what they thought had to be done. They, they were uh, not strong enough, we might say, to do that on their own. Uh, there was also the complexity that Rome was the occupying force. Rome was in charge. Rome had conquered the Jewish people at this point. And they were allowing the Jewish people to almost, we might say, pretend to rule themselves. They were given the illusion of uh, having some level of power, the Jewish leaders were. And of course, the condition there was that uh, you people have to maintain law and order. And if it gets out of hand, we're going to come in here, we're going to take care of it. And so the Jewish people, for that reason also, were very, very nervous about things getting out of control because they knew that they were on shaky ground there with the Romans. And so they hesitate to just go grab up Jesus during the Passover with uh, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of visitors there during this festival. Um, they seem at this point to be willing to wait at least a little bit so they can kill Jesus by stealth. So they want to do this undercover in the night in a way that maybe won't attract too much attention. They just want Jesus to disappear. They want to disappear him, we might say. Uh, according to Matthew and Mark, they want to do this stealthily or by stealth. Well, this leads us to something of a transition. So let's keep on going here to Luke 22, verses 3 through 6. Luke chapter 22, verses 3 through 6. And Satan entered into Judas, who was called Iscariot, belonging to the number of the twelve. And he went away and discussed with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. They were glad and agreed to give him money. So he consented and began seeking a good opportunity to betray him to them apart from the crowd. Well, verse 3 is rather strange, isn't it? That is an unusual verse. Satan enters into Judas. And we aren't given too much information here as to exactly what this means. Other than that, Satan entered into Judas. Well, exactly what happens here? In what sense does Satan enter Judas? Well, we're not really told. Uh, we don't have that. We don't have an answer to that question. However, we are told what Judas does. He heads off to the chief priest and he formulates this plan. And this plan involves money. And so it seems that Satan perhaps get in, gets involved here through some kind of money-based temptation. Does that ever happen today? Does Satan get to us through money? Absolutely, he does. And that seems to be exactly how uh, temptation works today. Satan will exploit our weaknesses. I think we might say Satan probably knows our weaknesses even better than we do. And certainly that was the case with Judas, and that seems to be the way that it, that it goes down here. Uh, if you remember back in John eleven fifty seven, 57, the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where Jesus was, they were to report it so that they might seize him. Uh, so some of the commentaries have suggested that Judas might have been a little bit torn between obeying the authorities and obeying the Lord here. So a little bit of a, a division in his loyalty. So obviously he's with Jesus. He's one of the 12. On the other hand, he's also a, a faithful Jewish person as far as most people know outwardly. And so he had some respect for the Jewish authorities and they had called for people to turn the Lord in. And so there is this back and forth. Do I follow Jesus? Do I follow these religious and civil leaders? So that has been one possibility that uh, has led to people to come to some understanding of how Satan entered into Judas, at least some of the struggle that might have been going on in his mind. Uh, some have suggested that Judas was a little bit disappointed after the triumphal entry that happened just a few days before this on Sunday, um, that Jesus didn't come to rule as an earthly king. And so Judas was let down in a sense. He'd been with Jesus for three and a half years. The kingdom's coming, it's coming, it's almost here. And then Jesus enters into Jerusalem and he's not king. Nothing happened. What in the world? And so this isn't happening the way I imagined it. And so maybe Judas was disillusioned. And maybe that leads to this sense that he needs to switch sides and turn against Jesus. Uh, some have suggested that Judas was upset about being publicly reprimanded by the Lord not too long before this. You may remember um, in the situation with the woman anointing Jesus with the expensive perfume, Judas objected to that. You know, this could have been used to feed the poor or whatever. And you may remember Jesus corrected him publicly, called him out on it in front of everybody. And people think that, well, maybe that hurt his feelings and that 
kind of turned him to the other side. Uh, but ultimately, though, it is it seems to be greed that brings Judas down. It is the temptation of money. And Satan sees that weakness and he exploits it. And remember, as I just said, this is not new for Judas. It, going back to that passage in John 12, when the woman anointed Jesus with the expensive perfume and Judas was upset and he says, why then was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to poor people? You know, 300 denarii, a denarius is a day's wage. So 300 days wages. We're, we're talking like fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 of perfume in today's economy. And, and Judas says, well, we could have fed a lot of poor people with that. Well, of course, we know if we know John that John goes on to explain he said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief and he had the money box and he used to pilfer or steal what was put into it. And so Judas was very much motivated by money in a bad way. That, that was his weakness. And it seems that Satan sees that and he takes advantage of that weakness here. At this point, both Mark and Luke tell us that the chief priests are glad when they come to an agreement, how strange that is to be glad to arrange somebody's murder. It does not make sense to us. And yet we see the same thing today. We see people gleefully happy about various forms of murder from time to time. But uh, to these people, killing Jesus is about to make their lives a lot easier. We'll finally get him out of here. Jesus is a problem and killing him gets rid of the problem, at least the way that they see it. If we were together, I might ask, why didn't the chief priest just arrest Jesus when he was teaching in the temple? After all, he's there every single day. They're in charge of the temple. Why not just do it? You know, why work out this plan behind the scenes with one of the apostles? Why is this betrayal even necessary? There are a few things that we could say there. But again, to me, it seems the reason goes back to these people being scared of the crowds. They are cowards. And they are scared of causing the riot. They're scared of what the Romans might do. And so they need this thing to happen at night, away from the crowds, when Jesus is not in the city. At this point, after coming to an agreement, Judas starts looking for an opportunity. So now he's actively looking for a chance to obey or to, uh, to um, deny the Lord or to betray the Lord, we should say. And Luke specifically says that he's looking for an opportunity to do this apart from the crowd. So now Judas is thinking the same way that the uh, Jewish leaders are thinking. So this needs to be done quietly. Uh, perhaps in the middle of the night. Uh, Matthew also tells us that they agree to an amount, so that the amount is in Matthew, but not here, 30 pieces of silver. And they actually weigh out the money at this point. They, they weigh out the money and they give it to Judas. Um, there's been some discussion about the 30 pieces of silver. Exactly, it, is there any significance to that amount since it is listed in Matthew? And, and he, well, Matthew, he's probably... Uh, calculating the taxes on an amount like that as the accountant or as the tax collector. But he, he does. It's interesting. Um, Luke kind of doesn't care about the exact figure. Matthew, he's thinking about the figure. He's got that 30 pieces of silver. Uh, there is a prophecy over in Zechariah chapter 11, verse 12, that mentions 30 shekels of silver. And um, we know from history, some have looked it up and have said this is roughly the price of a slave. So if you are buying and selling human beings, 30 pieces of silver was the going rate for a, a human purchase back in those days. So perhaps that is one reason. Um, but anyway, I, I find it interesting that it is not hundreds of pounds of gold, is it? It's, it's not anything that anybody might consider to be a good deal in that sense. It's not showing the worth of Jesus, but I guess my point here is, is pointing out that it is a low amount, the price of purchasing a slave. Uh, but it's not a massive amount. It's not like $50,000 or 300 denarii or whatever, but it is uh, 30 pieces of, of silver. Okay, let's keep on going then to uh, Luke chapter 22, verses 7 through 16. Luke 22, verses 7 through 16. Then came the first day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. And Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, so that we may eat it. They said to him, Where do you want us to prepare it? And he said to them, When you have entered the city, a man will meet you, carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house that he enters. And you shall say to the owner of the house, The teacher says to you, where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? 
and he will show you a large furnished upper room. Prepare it there. And they left and found everything just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. When the hour had come, he reclined at the table, and the apostles with him, and he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So now we come to the first day of unleavened bread. This is the day the people would prepare for the big Passover meal. They would prepare for this meal uh, during the day on Thursday. They would eat the meal in the evening. As I understand it, there's been a lot of discussion on the timeline here. Uh, remember, for Jewish people, their day started at 6 p.m. at sundown. Um, so they are now getting ready for this evening meal during the day on Thursday. Uh, Luke is the only one who tells us that Peter and John are sent on this mission. And the mission is get dinner ready. <laughs> get this going. And, and they want to know where to do this. It seems that Jesus has a plan. Uh, Jesus already has something lined up, apparently. Uh, this is a little bit similar to the situation with the colt just from a few days before this. It sounds a little bit familiar, doesn't it? A little bit of a parallel there. Peter and John are to head into Jerusalem. They are to look for a guy carrying a pitcher of water. He will meet you. You need to follow him to a house. Uh, some have said it was customary for women to carry water. Therefore, it would have been unusual for a man. So that's why this man would have stood out. I don't know if that's the case, if this was some kind of secret sign, if this was just the person that they would meet. I, I don't know. Uh, but when they find the owner of the house, they're to ask him about the guest room. And they are to ask on behalf of the teacher which is interesting. There are tens of thousands of teachers in this area, but the teacher needs a room. Uh, Matthew is just a little bit different. They are to say to the owner, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I am to keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. Well, we need to remember the Passover is a huge deal. It's a big holiday. One of the big three. Jerusalem would have been jam-packed with pilgrims, with people from all over the world. Uh, we might compare it to Thanksgiving or Christmas here in our culture. I mean, you aren't going to find a place for 13 people to eat a huge elaborate dinner with just a few hours notice, but that's what happens. And so Jesus has clearly made arrangements beforehand, or this is somehow miraculously prepared, we aren't told. Uh, another note, Jesus is not stealing the house, <laughs> is he? He's not squatting on this property. He's not taking it over just as he does not steal the horse a few days before this. But Jesus has people, doesn't he? He has people who are interested in his mission, who are on the, the same team, and who are his supporters. And so Jesus has a homeowner in this city who is already willing to let the Lord use his home for this very significant meal. And it sounds as if Jesus has clearly uh, prepped the man about his time coming at some point. And so there has been some perhaps private teaching between Jesus and the homeowner. And so now the message is, my time is at hand. What we talked about is now upon us. This is it. And uh, the time that we talked about some time ago is now here. I would also point out, we have a reminder here that Jesus is pretty much homeless. He doesn't have a, a mansion set aside in Jerusalem. He doesn't have a home of his own. But he relies on the generosity of others. He borrows a home for a few hours, just as he will go on to borrow a rich man's tomb in a couple days. And not only is he borrowing the home itself, we also find in verse 12 that the home is already furnished. We think about a furnished apartment. It's not just an empty house, but everything you need is already there. It's ready and waiting. And, um, and Peter and John, need all they need to do is just show up and start getting this meal together. In verse 13, Peter and John head out. They find everything exactly as Jesus had told them it would be. And then they prepare the Passover. Uh, starting... In verse 14, it is time for dinner. So this is it. This is the Lord's last Passover on this earth. And when they recline at the table, notice how Jesus opens the meal. Jesus says, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Those are his opening words over the dinner table. When Jesus uses the word that we translate uh, here as earnestly desire, I always find it interesting that it's the same word that we also translate elsewhere as lust. Uh, to lust is to earnestly desire over someone or something. Of course, in English, to lust over something is clearly uh, a fairly negative thing, isn't it? Uh, but the word itself that uh, Luke uses here, it is morally neutral. 
we can earnestly desire something in a good way or in a bad way. And obviously here, Jesus was earnestly desiring. He was really looking forward to being together with his disciples for this Passover meal. This was an incredibly personal event. He had been with them for three and a half years since he chose them to be his apostles. And now this, this is the last night together as a group. And so that's what's going on here in this passage. This is his last one. Notice he will not eat this meal again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. He doesn't elaborate. He doesn't really explain exactly what that means, but he just leaves it right there. This is a significant meal. At this point, we insert the passage from John 13, verses 1 through 20, about Jesus washing the disciples' feet. And we won't read this passage here, as we've already studied this in the past. But this is where Jesus takes off his garment. He puts on a towel. He wraps himself in a towel. He kneels down. He washes the apostles' feet one by one. And in the end, uh, he explains that he's doing this to give them an example to follow. He's not establishing some new religi religious ritual of some kind. This is not a ceremony that we need to perform once a quarter, once a year, as some religious groups do. But he's simply saying, you guys need to do whatever it is that needs to be done. Uh, we're not above other people here. We're, we're here to serve one another. And that's how this meal starts out. I've earnestly desired to eat this meal with you. And he, and he kneels down and he washes their feet. Uh, God's work might not always be glamorous, but that's not why we're in it, is it? Whether it's providing a room like the homeowner did, or whether it's preparing a meal, actual cooking like Peter and John apparently did, uh, all of us just jump in and we do whatever it is that needs to be done. Nothing is beneath us in the Lord's kingdom. We just do the work that God has called us to do. We serve. We serve each other. I might have mentioned uh, many years ago, this is back uh, before we lived in Madison, we had an, I'd say a, pretty much an elderly woman. Of course, as I've grown older, my definition of elderly has changed a little bit. But uh, there was an elderly woman who had volunteered for, to clean the building. And she, a new convert, she had just obeyed the gospel and she wanted to do something. And we, you always need people to clean the building, don't you? And so she's like, I'll do that. I, I want to clean the building. So after a few weeks or months, uh, she came to me and she said, you know, we really need a mop bucket. And um, yeah, you know, we need a mop bucket. That's not something we had down there, but you need something to wring out the mop. We didn't even, we didn't even have that. The, uh, it had been an interesting experience down there. But uh, anyway, so we went out, we bought a mop bucket and uh, I turned the expense in to, uh, to the congregation. And I remember about a month later when that, uh, when that hit, we, we looked at that. And there was a man who, as I saw it, could have been a future elder. He kind of had that leadership potential there. And he was incredibly upset that we had spent 30 or whatever dollars it was for the mop bucket. And I can't believe, you know, we spent $35 on a mop bucket. And just thinking about that, I contained my, <laughs> I think I contained my anger, but how, how frustrating it was. Here's this elderly woman willing to do whatever it took to get the building clean. We appreciated her hard work. I mean, the least we could do is get her the tools that she needed. And at that moment, I remember thinking to myself in terms of leadership in the Lord's church, I remember thinking, I actually wrote it down later, an elder needs to know not so much how much the mop bucket costs as much as he needs to know how the mop handle feels. Does that make sense? And I remember thinking that at that moment, and I think that's true today. Um, we need to be serving one another in the church. Nothing is beneath us. Everything out there, there are things that need to get done, and we work together, and we do the job. And uh, that's kind of one lesson. I always think about that when we just briefly look at this uh, situation with Jesus washing the apostles' feet. Of course, Peter didn't want him to wash his feet, did he? And then there was that little interchange or a little exchange there. And uh, But anyway, we could go back and look at that if we wanted to. But let's get back to uh, the book of Luke. And just a note here, in Luke we are skipping Luke 22, 17 through 20 for now. Because in a rare occurrence, as I mentioned earlier, Luke seems to ever so slightly deviate from chronological order. It's all in the same night, 
so it's not far off. It, it's right here. We're, we're on Thursday evening. Um, but in the harmony, we go from Jesus washing the disciples' feet to Jesus' identification of Judas as the betrayer. Um, only because this seems to happen earlier in the dinner before he institutes the Lord's Supper. So we're just doing a little flip-flop here. We're going to do Luke uh, 22, 21 through 23 before we come back to verses 17 through 20 next week, if the Lord will. So we're not skipping anything permanently. We're just uh, mixing up our order here. So Luke 22, verses 21 through 23. But behold, the hand of the one betraying me is with mine on the table. For indeed, the Son of Man is going as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to discuss among themselves which one of them it might be who was going to do this thing. If you're following along in the harmony, you'll notice this is one of those events that is in all four gospel accounts. We have four parallel columns here. In Luke, as they are eating, notice here Jesus says, The hand of the one betraying him is with his on the table. And here Luke adds something not found in the other accounts in verse 22, that the Son of Man is going just as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. In other words, it has to happen. Somebody has to do it. Somebody's going to betray the Lord. But you really don't want to be that guy. You don't want to be the guy who does it. And at this point, everybody tries to figure out who he's talking about. It's one of their own. He's in the inner circle of apostles here. He's, he's one of the twelve. Then in Matthew and Mark, Jesus identifies the betrayer as the one who dipped his hand with him in the bowl. And that's kind of strange to say, the one who previously dipped his hand with me in the bowl. Well, what in the world is going on there? Well, I'm assuming that it was something of an awkward moment at the time that it happened and memorable at the time that it happened, but not something that anybody else would have seen. And so this is something that Judas would remember, but nobody else would have caught on to. Um, I'm thinking it might be like us as a church going out to Laredo's for lunch after worship, as some of us used to do in the olden days, way back before the pandemic. Remember, we used to go to Laredo's and, and eat with a ginormous table sitting around, dipping chips, sharing dip, and ooh, all, that kind of, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, imagine two of us each taking a tortilla chip and dipping it into the salsa bowl at the same moment. Mm -hmm. You know, oops, uh, it's a little bit of an awkward moment for a split second. <laughs> Ooh, you know, okay. Uh, but, you know, we move on. Not a big deal. It's just kind of, uh, that's, we kind of, we touch chips. And, and yet 15 minutes later, when somebody refers to it, only the two people who did it would remember. And that seems to be what's going on here. This is Jesus' sign to Judas. I know that you're the one. And yet he doesn't call them out publicly. It's, it's a private signal between them. In John's account, we have a reference to one of the disciples whom Jesus loved, often assumed to be John. Uh, this man is resting his head on the Lord's chest. And Peter comes in really close. And so it's Jesus and Peter and most likely John. And Peter comes in close and he wants to know who it is. Kind of, if I could paraphrase, all right, Jesus, just between the three of us, who is it? You, you can tell us. We're your... We're your inner circle right here. Who's, who's going to do it? And Jesus says, that is the one for whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him. And Jesus then dips something and he hands it to Judas. And so what's going on there is Jesus is sharing this with Peter and the disciple whom he loves, again, most likely John, that Judas is the betrayer. So he does uh, let at least two of his disciples in on this secret. In Matthew's account, Judas speaks up at some point in here and says, Surely it is not I, Rabbi. And Jesus answers and says, You have said it yourself. That's very unusual too, isn't it? He doesn't really say yes or no. He just said, You said it and leaves it there. At this point in John, after Judas had eaten that piece of food Jesus gave to him, Jesus says, What you do, do quickly. Uh, John tells us that nobody else really knew what was going on with that. Uh, some assumed that Jesus had told him to go purchase something. You know, go buy us some napkins or, or go get us whatever for the meal. They just assumed that he was doing that or that he was telling him to go give something to the poor since Judas obviously had the money box. And it's interesting to me that just from a day-to-day -day operations point of view, 
Jesus could miraculously create bread, couldn't he? He could create fish. He could create wine out of water and, and all that. And yet they had an actual treasury, didn't they? Jesus didn't just go around miraculously doing things financially, but they had an actual treasury. They had an actual box and it was funded by donations. We have the list of several women who were primary contributors to that treasury. And the funds from that box took care of their daily expenses and they were also used to take care of the poor. And that's always interesting to me just to see how that worked financially, Judas being the treasurer of that group. John tells us that Judas leaves at this point and that it is, that it is night now. Uh, with that in mind, it seems like a good place for us to call it a night, <laughs> if, if I dare say that. Uh, but let's pause here, and then let's pick up next week with Luke 22, 24, and then we'll also backtrack, and we'll look at the Lord's Supper at that point as well. Uh, thank you for being with us tonight, either online or on the phone. Uh, be sure to send me any prayer requests or concerns so we can get those in the bulletin. Several of you have sent emails already this week. Um, also, please be sure to sign up online for worship this coming Lord's Day. If you could do that tonight, that would be the best. So while you're thinking about it, go ahead and sign up so we can start getting some idea of how many will be here on Sunday at 9. Again, we'll have the one service at 9, and then if needed, if that one fills up, then we will replay that service on the projector at 10.30. And again, the, the online and the phone options remain the same. Uh, let us close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you for Jesus, our Passover, who willingly went to the cross for us as an offering for sin. We're thankful for his life of service and sacrifice. Tonight, we're especially thankful for your written word so that we can study it on our own. We're thankful for the tools that are available to us, books like the Harmony of the Gospels and Bible Dictionaries and the writings of knowledgeable men and women who have dedicated their lives to studying and explaining your word. Be with those who are traveling over the holidays. Be with those who have suffered losses. And be with those who are mourning. This is an especially difficult time for many of our members, and we ask for your mercy and grace on them during this difficult time. Thank you for being with us as a congregation over this year. It's been strange, it's been challenging, but we know looking back on it that you have been with us. You have brought several of our members safely through some very difficult challenges, huge changes at school and at work, financial challenges. Several have been sick with the virus, but have come through on the other side. We praise you for that. We praise you for being so good to us, far beyond what we deserve. We've also had some good opportunities to help others this year, not just our own members, but also people in this community who've been hungry and in need of food. You've allowed us to help the children at Schultz Lewis. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of that as well. You've also given us the ability to stay connected online and on the phone as a congregation. We praise you for allowing us to be so well prepared seemingly by your providential care. Thank you for the skills of the young women, men and women of the congregation who have kept us online in, in various ways. As we get ready to enter a new year, we want to make ourselves available to be used by you in any way that you see fit. We love you and we thank you for being so good to us. We come to you in the name of Jesus, your Son, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.